So often, I'll have students ask me, what is the highest yield thing on the MCAT? And it's not magnetism or fluid dynamics or even Freud. The highest thing on the MCAT, and it's not even close, is amino acids. Are you going to see a question on magnetism on test day? Maybe. You might see a question. You might see a passage. You might see nothing. But amino acids? You're probably going to see at least five or six, maybe ten questions that require you to know about amino acids. So without further ado, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. So... There are 20 main amino acids. The, these amino acids are, have all sorts of different properties. Note that when I say there's 20, there's 20 main ones that we see in humans. There is actually a 21st named selenocysteine. Looks just like cysteine, but it's got a selenium instead of a sulfur. But that amino acid, of all the hundreds of thousands of proteins that we find in, in human cells, it's only in about like 25 of them. That amino acid is in 25 total proteins. So... The MCAT doesn't ask about it that much. It was actually discovered fairly recently, and there's not much material to be asked about. So most of the MCAT, for us, we're going to pretend that there are just 20 amino acids. Now, these amino acids, as I mentioned, can be organized into different groups. We have the charged ones. They can be both positive or negatively charged. We also have the ones that are polar, um, and so they are more often found on the outside of proteins, interacting with the water solvent layer around them. There's also the aromatic amino acids, you know, taking a flashback, thinking about organic chemistry. Hopefully we're comfortable with what it means to be an aromatic compound. Turns out there are some amino acids that are aromatic. And lastly, there's the aliphatic. So the aliphatic amino acids, aliphatic is just a fancy word for carbons and hydrogens, but not aromatic. So there, there's a lot of amino acids that fit into this category. It's probably got the most of all the, the different categories. The reason I break them down into these different groups is not because, you know, it's just easier to, like, to show slides and things like that, but you need to think about them as these groups. I actually encourage students to study them as groups. Say on Monday, you start off studying just the charged amino acids. You write them out at breakfast, you write them out at lunch, at dinner, and then the next day you start to add in the aromatic ones, and then the polar, and then the aliphatic. And then by the end of the week, you'll have all of your amino acids mastered. But it's not just about the structure. You do need to know the structure, but you also need to know the three and one letter symbols. For example, tyrosine is TYR for the three letter symbol, or just Y for the one letter. Why is it Y? Well, threonine had already taken T. And so there, most of these make sense, like glycine is G, cysteine is C, histidine is H. But there's a couple weird ones like tyrosine is Y, tryptophan is W, lysine is K. It, you want to make sure that you understand these, and we'll talk about how the MCAT will test that here in a little bit. But I also want to talk about some special amino acids, and since we're talking about tyrosine, we might as well start here. Note that it is aromatic. It's got a tire in it. That's how I remember tyrosine. But it's also got this OH group. It's not the only one with an alcohol group coming off the side. There's also serine and threonine that fit into that category as well. Those amino acids are particularly uh, important because if we have like a protein with a serine on the side, that OH that is off of the side of it, we can add a phosphate group to. And so whenever we talk about phosphorylating a protein, generally it's serine, threonine, or tyrosine is the vast majority of those. There's also um, proline. Now proline is kind of interesting because it's our group actually reaches around and grabs on to the amino group in the backbone. Speaking of, like, we should, we should men talk about this. Every amino acid, you know, kind of going back to, to tyrosine here, has a carboxylic acid up top and an amino group off to the side. Amino acid. That's why they're called amino acids, is because they all have an amino group and an acid. And then they have this R group that can change. The R groups that we're talking about here are the ones that we see in humans, but there's other ones. There's ones that appear in bacteria. There's even synthetic, like fake amino acids that you can create in a lab. As long as it's got an amino group and a carboxylic acid group, it's an amino acid. So talking about proline, it's kind of interesting because the R group actually reaches around and grabs on to the amino backbone. So if we have a chain uh, of proteins, of a, of a chain of amino acids, and we introduce a proline, what happens is it reaches around and grabs onto the chain and creates a kink. Proline's the kinky amino acid. That's an easy way to remember it. Now, we also have glycine. Glycine is... <laughs> the reason glycine is so interesting is because it's boring. It's, it's our group is just an H. It's the simplest amino acid. It's also, because there are two H groups, it's also the only achiral amino acid. 
Every other amino acid is going to be a chiral one, and so that makes glycine stand out a little bit. We also have cysteine. Cysteine is, of all the amino acids, perhaps the most, you're going to see the most questions about this one. The, the SH group that you see on the end, the thiol group, if you have two cysteines in a chain, they each cysteine can lose a hydrogen, and the cysteines, like the sulfurs, will bind each other. We call that a disulfide bridge or a disulfide bond. As you can see, they can happen within a single chain. We can have an intramolecular within the molecule disulfide bridge. You can also have an intermolecular disulfide bridge, which is like between two different molecules, between two different proteins. This actually happens a lot, a lot more than I think students realize. Whenever we have multiple protein subunits that come together, most of the time, or at least a lot of the time, they're held together by disulfide bridges. Um, like some famous examples, like complexes of proteins, you should think about the electron transport chain. There's like complex one, complex two, complex three, complex four. The reason they're called complexes is because it's more than one amino acid, or, or more than one protein chain in the structure. So, like putting this all together, we can create these chains of proteins. And note that the carboxylic acid of one amino acid and the amino end of another amino acid can come together and create an amide, which is a peptide bond. This is a bond between two specific amino acids. And we can build this infinitely long. The largest protein is Titan, and it is huge. To write out the name of it, to write out the amino acids in order, and, and to read it would take something like 70 days to read through it, just because there's so many amino acids. But at the end of this, we're going to have a carboxy terminus, right? Because we're going to have a carboxylic acid sticking out. And on the other end, we're going to have an amino terminus, where we have a nitrogen sticking out. Sometimes you'll hear the MCAT and, like, different, uh, like, resources talk about the, like, C terminus and the N terminus. What they mean is the carboxy terminus and the amino terminus. So now we understand all the different amino acids. We understand how they're kind of put together. How is the MCAT likely to test this? Well, we'll talk about that. One way the MCAT can test this is by giving you a structure and asking you to identify the amino acids present. And, and this is, seems like a really overwhelming task the first time you get asked to do this. There's so much stuff going on and, and students tend to panic. But remember, every time we form a peptide bond, we're going to have an amide. And we can kind of see there's like this chain kind of like going through everything here. And you can kind of see that there's, there's a backbone to this. So if you ever find yourself lost, you can go and try to find like a specific region here where there is an amide. So that is a peptide bond. And so once you see this, like, oh, okay, well, we've got this carboxylic acid here. We've got our R group here. And we've got our nitrogen or amino group here. And so from there, it's easy to see, well, then that must be another peptide bond. And so we've got this one amino acid. It's actually glutamine with the two carbons and then the carbonyl attached to the amino group. And so from here, it's easy to like kind of like just go through and just like, okay, well, carboxylic acid, R group, amine. Carboxylic acid, R group, amine. And so you can start to kind of go through and see where each of these peptide bonds is. And so you can kind of create and identify each one of these individual amino acids. Note that the MCAT could write, like, like give you the structure the way this is, or they could just tell you what the amino acid is. And they might do it with one-letter symbols. For example, this first one here, it's got this wheel of nitrogens, right? That's going to be arginine. The symbol is R. Then we've got a, a the R group here kind of reaches around and grabs onto the nitrogen. That's going to be a proline, right? And so that's what we have here. This is our proline. And then above that, we have a lysine, which is K. We have another proline here. We have, uh, next we have a glutamine, and then another glutamine. And then we have a phenylalanine, and then we have another phenylalanine. Then we got a real boring one. That's going to be glycine. Then we have leucine, and lastly we have methionine. So the MCAT could give you either of these. They could give you the structure and ask you about it, or they could just say, here's the protein, RPKPQQFFGLM, and that's the protein. These are the same thing. You need to understand that the MCAT can give you either of these, and you need to be able to identify and like understand that they're the same thing. Another thing that I'll note here, this is just like a great visualization, that if you look at that like general shape of this protein, note that it kind of bends here. This bend here, proline. This bend here, proline. It's a good indication of showing you what's going on with proline as it induces kinks in a protein chain. So is that it? Are we just going to be asked to identify amino acids? 
Well, not exactly. The MCAT can start to do some really weird things about like identifying how mutations can affect a protein. So let's talk about that. When asking about the effect of mutations on amino acids, the MCAT will use some specific nomenclature that for a lot of people is going to be very foreign. That you might see something like they talk about this, this mutation. Let's say they say this mutation is a P17K mutation. Now, a lot of students are going to be like, I have no idea what that means. What that means is in our big long chain of amino acids, right? We have amino acid 16, we have amino acid 17, and amino acid 18 in this big long chain. Now, amino acid 17 was a proline, and the mutation has changed it into a lysine. So we did have a proline here, and now it's a lysine, which is K. This mutation is probably going to have some really big effects, because if we had a proline there, we probably needed that, that bend in, in the protein strand. Then we switched out proline, which is nonpolar, for lysine, which is a charged amino acid. So we're kind of like switching out two very different ingredients, and there's a good chance that that's going to break a lot of things. There's also really interesting mutations. Let's say we set, had a mutation that was like S18D. Now, S is serine, 18 is the number of the amino acid that is mutated, and D is aspartic acid. So the amino acid 18 in this protein, we change from serine to aspartic acid. So if we, let's say that we had this, like, protein here, and let's say that there was a glutamic acid here, just like this is what's going on in, in the protein. And let's say that this is this serine that we're talking about, and so this is going to have an OH. Now, we talked about how um, amino acids, serine, threonine, and tyrosine can be phosphorylated. So we might come in here and we might phosphorylate this protein, which is going to give it a negative charge. Now, glutamic acid is already negatively charged, and it's always negatively charged. So these amino acids, like the glutamic acid and the phosphorylated serine, are going to repel each other. And so we might see that this protein changes conformation. Let's say it's opening up its active site because now we have this negative charge here and those are going to repel. It's going to open the mouth of the, the enzyme or protein so that it can actually work. And this is why phosphorylating proteins can activate or deactivate uh, an enzyme because it actually changes the conformational structure. Now with this mutation, right? We had serine at position 18 that we changed into an aspartic acid. So this serine is no longer a serine. It's something else. It's an aspartic acid. And we can't phosphorylate an aspartic acid, so we can eliminate that. But note that aspartic acid is a negatively charged amino acid. And it's always negatively charged, like, like all the time, just like glutamic acid. And so as a result, this protein, like these charges, will be repelling each other. So this protein, you can't turn it on or off. It's always on because the negative charges have opened the mouth of this enzyme. This mutation is a mutation that is mimicking the phosphorylated state. It's a phosphomimetic mutation, phosphate mimicking mutation. The MCAT could throw this at you in a passage, and they need to know that you understand that, ooh, this, this mutation here is one that's going to mimic the phosphorylation state. And that's something that a lot of students haven't seen. So as you can see, the MCAT can test amino acids in a lot of like crazy different ways, like talking about individual mutations, strictly identifying the properties of, of an amino acid, or even identifying from a big structure. You need to make sure that you are ready for it, because as I mentioned, amino acids are the highest yield thing on the MCAT.